Hello there, Pastor Dave with Pilgrim Lutheran Brethren Church. We're glad you could join us again today for today's online sermon. Today's sermon text is Mark 1, 29 through 39. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they immediately told Jesus about her. So he went to her took her hand, and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. That evening, after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak, because they knew who he was. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. 
Jesus replied, Let us go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Um, thank you that um, you speak to us, to speak into our, our lives, to let us know your will. And Father, we pray this day that your Holy Spirit will speak to our hearts in your heavenly name. Amen. Well, today's sermon is entitled, Why Does God Heal Anyone? And it's actually a continuation of last week's sermon. So, quick question for you. Are you guilty of binge-watching television shows? I know I am. And you know how often they do that recap at the beginning? Do you watch the recap or do you skip over them? I know sometimes we want to skip over them. We get in that frantic, where's the remote? Because we can't get to it within the first few seconds, and then you're stuck watching the whole thing. Well, unfortunately, today we're going to start off with a recap. Last week's sermon was entitled, Who is Jesus and Why Do I Care? And we looked at Jesus' identity and authority according to Mark in Mark 1, 14 through 28. And we talked a little bit about the identity and the authority of the author of Mark, a man who was actually named John Mark. And we also talked about Mark's mission and his reason for writing his gospel. Mark wanted to provide you and I with proof of Jesus' identity and his authority. Uh, Jesus' identity and authority as the Messiah, as the Christ, as Christ's anointed one. And we began by looking at Mark 1, 14 through 28, when Jesus began his ministry in Capernaum. Now, Capernaum was a small trading village of about 1,500 people, right on the Sea of Galilee. And that's where Jesus called four fishermen as his first four disciples. And we saw that Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. And do you remember what that good news is? Jesus says, the time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. With Jesus, the kingdom of God has come near. Then on the Sabbath, the Jewish holy day, Jesus and his ragtag band of smelly fishermen walk into a synagogue a Jewish church, and there Jesus taught with authority, and he commanded a demon to leave a man, and it did. And the people must have been thinking to themselves, who is Jesus, and why do we care? And how did he answer their question? Well, he taught God's word with authority, and he revealed he also had authority to command evil spirits. Jesus did what only God has the authority to do. Therefore, ergo, ipso facto, calypso oreo, Jesus must be God, is what we concluded. Then, Mark tells us in verse 28, news about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. The Greek word that's translated news here can, be also, trans can also be translated as fame. So Jesus became famous, like a modern-day celebrity. And that's kind of where we pick up the story today in Mark 1, 29. Take a look. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they immediately told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on him. So we see Jesus heals Simon's mother-in-law. Okay, so I know that some of us might be thinking some interesting things when we read this. Looking at it through the lens of our modern social and political culture, we might mistake what's happening here as sexism. I mean, seriously, this woman is sick, and Jesus heals her just so she can make him a sandwich? Are you kidding me? To interpret this event that way would be to make a serious, serious error. So let's go back up and try to understand it the same way that the original first century audience would have. First of all, we see that we're in the home of Simon, 
and Andrew, two of the fishermen Jesus called at the Sea of Galilee, who, if you remember, said, Mark says, they immediately left their nets and followed Jesus. And last week I told you that Mark was actually named John Mark. Well, Simon might be even more confusing. You see, Simon was also known as Simon Peter, Simeon, Peter the Disciple, Cephas, Peter the Apostle, or even St. Peter in the Catholic Church. Simon will become one of the leading 12 disciples of Jesus. But when they get to Simon and Andrew's home, they discover that Simon's mother-in-law is sick. You know, today we would be like, that's no big deal. So what? She has a fever. Take some ibuprofen or some Tylenol and drink some Gatorade. And you know what? Get some good rest and you'll feel better in a day or two. Or worst case, we'd say, you know, if it gets real bad, go to the doctor, get some antibiotics and you'll kick this no time. But at this time, in the first century, none of that existed. If you got sick and it went to a fever, you often weren't long for this world. So, again, they discover that Simon's mother-in-law is sick, really sick. And then we see two miraculous events. First, we see a man asking for healing for one of his in-laws. In, in many of these cases, these relationships can be so volatile. But often we joke. I mean, the one joke that I always heard is, what's the difference between an in-law and an outlaw? Outlaws are wanted. We joke, but still, these relationships can be volatile. But the second and the actual miraculous event that we see is that Jesus heals Simon's mother-in-law. Look at verse 31. So he went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. The ESV, or the English Standard Version, translated, translates it this way. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Now, I prefer this translation for two reasons. First of all, I think it's truer to the original Greek. But also, it connects what Jesus tells us in John 3, 14 through 16. Take a look at it. Jesus says, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Going back to Mark 131 in the ESV, we see it again. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. The fact that she's waiting on them, it, it implies that she wasn't just kind of healed. She's not just a little bit healed. No, she was completely healed. And the fact that the person being healed in this story is a woman is also significant because it shows that from the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, he sided with those who were marginalized in that society. So we see that Jesus' authority is, is evident because he teaches with authority. He has the authority to command demons, and now we see that he has the authority to heal the sick. Now, I know it may not be everyone's culture, but even in a lot of modern cultures, to not show hospitality to guests would be shameful, whether you are a woman or a man. But really, Jesus, God incarnate, just saved her life. And we see that her immediate response, what she wants to do is to serve him, to serve the Lord. She was not only healed physically, but she was strengthened to serve. His cure equips her for action. This is the image of discipleship. A pastor that I used to sit under used to always say, you are saved to serve, not to sit. And that is what we see here. When Simon's mother-in-law was saved, what did she do? She served. She didn't sit. Now look at Mark 1, verses 32 through 34. That evening, after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door. 
And Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons. But he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Now remember, it was, it, it was the Sabbath, the Jewish holy day. And the Sabbath runs from sunset on Friday till sunset on Saturday. So they wouldn't have been permitted to do any work during the Sabbath. You know, work like carrying your sick loved one to be healed. And Mark tells us that the people brought all the sick and demon-possessed people. Now, some commentators say that this word, use of the word all, it's, it's just hyperbole. Hyperbole is like an exaggerated statement or claim. So it doesn't really mean all, it's just an exaggeration. But I think that Mark backs this statement up by telling us in verse 33 that the whole town gathered at the door. Remember, 1,500 people lived in Capernaum. And Jesus, and it says that Jesus healed many who had various diseases. And he also drew, drove out many demons. So we see that Jesus healed many, but not all. Jesus drove out many demons, but not all. And when Jesus drove these demons out, Mark tells us he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Jesus did the same thing when he cast out the demon in last week's sermon text. In Mark 1, 25-26, we hear, Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. And I asked the question last week, why do you think Jesus told the demon to be quiet? What did it say? Well, it had asked Jesus what Jesus was going to do to it. And then it said, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And I asked you then why you thought that Jesus told them to be quiet. And I promised you that I would tell you this week. Well, here's the thing. The Bible doesn't explicitly tell us why Jesus did what he did. But most commentators agree that Jesus likely silenced the demons because he knew that they would misrepresent him and distort the nature of his mission. They would lie about him. So look at Mark 1, 35. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. Remember, Jesus has healed many, but not all the people. His works in casting out demons and healing the sick reveal the bond between sin and sickness, which corrupts the world and touches each of our lives. There was plenty more work to do. So what was Jesus doing out here just lollygagging? No, he's not lollygagging. He went off to a solitary place or a desolate place, the same place that he was tempted, the wilderness or the desert. He went to a solitary place to pray, to pray to his father. And we see in verse 36, Simon and his companions went to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. Why? Why are they looking for him? Well, for one thing, he's famous. But also, he healed many, but not all. There were still others who hadn't been healed. And if you were there, wouldn't you want you, yourself, or your loved one to be healed? That's why they're looking for him. But what we see is that healing wasn't Jesus' mission. Look at Jesus' words in verse 38. Jesus replied, Let us go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. Jesus could have stayed at Capernaum, and he could have become a local hero. He'd be huge. He was already famous. He could have healed all, not just many. But his decision was to move on. Why? Because Temporarily healing physically in this world wasn't his mission. Jesus says that the reason he came was to preach, to preach the good news, to tell the world, not just Capernaum, that the kingdom of God has come. 
That is Jesus' mission. That is why Jesus came. In a couple of chapters, Jesus will begin talking about that mission to his disciples, and it won't make sense to them at the time. You see, at the heart of Jesus' mission, it, it involves going to Jerusalem, where he will allow the religious authorities to kill him, where he will embrace death on the cross. And there, he will affect eternal, complete healing for the whole world. That is the heart of Jesus' mission. Driving out demons and healing the sick were only displays of his identity and authority. They revealed his identity and authority to those that he was preaching to. They answered the question, who is Jesus and why do you care? The reason he only healed many and not all wasn't because he favored some people over others. The Bible tells us and assures us that God doesn't have favorites. In Matthew 5, 44 through 45, Jesus tells us to love our enemies. He says, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Why? Well, first of all, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. But also, it says, He, God, causes His Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. God doesn't have favorites. He loves your enemies just as much as He loves you. The Apostle Paul tells us, Point blank in Romans 2.11, for God does not show favoritism. God doesn't have favorites. There are many false teachers out there that will tell you that if you're suffering some physical or mental illness, or if you've suffered a loss, a loss of a location or of your wealth, or maybe even a loved one, that God must somehow be punishing you for something that you did or didn't do that you must have some unresolved sin in your life. That's, that's why you're suffering. But Martin Luther is quoted as saying, All the wretchedness and misery rampant in the world is the work of the devil, who delights in bringing ruin and death on man. For it was he who plunged all human nature into sin and death. We should never see disease or as some sort of punishment sent to us from God. That doesn't mean it might not be natural consequences of our disobedience. But we also shouldn't see our, poster our prosperity necessarily as some kind of a bonus for good behavior either. Why? Because he causes his, rain, his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. So then there's also the question, well, you hear this often, why does God let bad things happen to good people? Well, I think the better question is, why does God heal anybody? Why does he give good things to anybody? Genesis tells us that when God created the world, including man, it was very good. But then we saw that Adam and Eve disobeyed God's command in an event called the fall. And evil in the forms of death and sin entered the world that day. Because of this event, we all inherit Adam's guilt and depravity. We are born spiritually dead, totally depraved, unable to help ourselves. When God commands good works, we can't obey. When God calls us to fear, love, and trust Him above all things, we can't do it. There is no such thing as good people. Romans 3.23 tells us, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The Bible also tells us the wages of sin is death. This is why we are all in need of a Savior. We all deserve death. So praise God when we see that God's provision in the very next verse, in verse 24, and all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. All have sinned but all are justified freely by His grace. That was Jesus' mission that day. It wasn't about who was or wasn't healed in Capernaum. It wasn't about who was good enough. Whether or not God chooses to heal you today, it's not about you. God is on a mission to save the entire world. 
So, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. And everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. And just as Jesus lifted up Simon's mother-in-law that day, Jesus tells us in John 6, verse 40, For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in Him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. If He has healed you, if He has freed you from sin, you have been saved. But remember that you have been saved for a purpose, for His purpose. You have been saved to serve Him, to display His authority in a world that's in need of a Savior. But He also promises that though we may die, He will raise you up on the last day. That day you will have total healing. Praise God. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, Thank you for your word. Thank you for sending your son with a mission to save the entire world, including us. Lord, we pray that your, um, your authority will be recognized um, around the world where, you're, where your message is being preached, that the kingdom of God has come near, and that forgiveness of sins is available to the entire world. Lord, we just pray that you'll help us to carry this message as well. In your heavenly name, amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face to shine upon you. Or lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and